We all know that on July 20th, 1969, two men set foot on the moon for the first time. A defining moment of the 20th century, a shining example of what the human spirit is truly capable of when we work together towards a common goal. It's a great story, but the official telling often leaves out all of the gritty details that actually make this journey so compelling. You might not know about the computer failure that happened 30,000 feet above the surface of the moon, the 15 seconds that separated life and death for Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, the pen that saved our astronauts from being stranded on the moon forever, or even the fiery brush with disaster at the 11th hour of the return to Earth. This is the real story of the Apollo 11 moon landing. This is the space race. Here in the present day, we've all grown accustomed to the fact that all spaceships are automated and autonomous. We still call it human spaceflight, but it's pretty clear that the robots are actually in charge. Look inside the SpaceX Crew Dragon capsule and you won't find any physical controls, just a bunch of iPads. Artemis 1 just flew to the moon and back with only a plastic dummy in the captain's chair, and we get a weekly demonstration just how deep this capability goes when the Falcon 9 booster returns from space on an automated flight path to touch down on an autonomous drone ship in the middle of the ocean. After seeing all of that, it becomes even more mind-blowing when we're told that NASA managed to land on the moon with a computer that was only slightly more capable than a pocket calculator. But in reality, Neil Armstrong didn't even have that. The first event that kicks off an Apollo moon landing is the separation of the lander from the command module. And it was at this point that the meticulously crafted plan for Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin goes completely out the window. They were not off to a good start. After the lunar excursion module, or LEM, maneuvers into position for deorbit, the main engine ignites to begin the descent burn. At around 30,000 feet above the surface of the moon, Neil turns to Buzz and tells him, I think we're coming in a little long, meaning that the LEM was still moving too fast and as a result, they were going to overshoot the targeted landing site, a location on the Sea of Tranquility that had been specifically chosen for being a very large area of perfectly flat and smooth lunar surface. That wasn't in the cards. Armstrong made a quick calculation looking at their trajectory on the map and the view out of his tiny triangular window and figured that they were headed three miles off course, now set to land on the side of a massive crater, a result that would have doomed the pair to certain failure and death on the moon. So Armstrong made the decision to pull a Luke Skywalker, put the computer guidance aside and take over manual control of the LEM. He would say in later interviews that he essentially started piloting the spaceship the same way that he would fly a helicopter. At the same time that all of this was happening, as if that wasn't enough, the cockpit of the lunar lander was being overtaken by flashing red lights and alarms. There were three rudimentary low-tech display screens in the LEM, and each one was overtaken by Program Alarm 1202. Neither Armstrong or Aldrin knew what that meant. This alarm code had never come up in any of their landing simulations back on Earth. They kept cool and radioed back to NASA asking what the problem was. In response, they were told, Roger got you, we're go on that alarm, which basically translates as, yeah, don't worry about it. At around 5,000 feet above the moon's surface, Armstrong starts the process of manually directing the craft towards what looks to him as a reasonable landing spot, trying to avoid the pockmarked landscape of craters and ridges. At 100 feet above the surface, Armstrong has his eyes glued on the window as his hands work the throttle control of their rocket engine. Aldrin is calmly reading out the numbers to his pilot, telling him the altitude, speed, and descent rate of the LEM. Buzz would later say in interviews that he was resisting any urge to rush Neil or say anything that would freak him out, but Aldrin could see from his meters that they were still 100 feet above ground, moving at 34 miles per hour, with just 60 seconds worth of fuel remaining in the tank. At this point, the thrust from the engine was kicking up moon dust and obscuring Neil's window, 
which at the time was their only tool for directing the LEM into a safe landing. Still, 10 feet above ground, Buzz saw their fuel supply trickle down to just 30 seconds of burn time remaining. At 5 feet above ground, the probes that extended out from the feet of the landing legs touched the lunar surface and started to bend under the weight of the craft. This triggered a significantly more reassuring signal light in the cockpit. Contact. The engine rumbles to a halt, and the lander settles down into the moon dust. The call comes back to NASA. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Where they ended up was about four miles away from that carefully chosen ideal landing site. It would turn out that an excess burst of air from the command module gave the LEM a slight push as the two separated. That little nudge is all it took to put them off course, and they arrived on the moon with about 15 seconds worth of fuel left in the tank. Any hesitation on Armstrong's part would have left them tumbling uncontrolled into the lunar surface making a new crater of their own. Of course, Neil Armstrong stuck the landing. There's a reason that NASA put this particular individual in the driver's seat of Apollo 11. Armstrong was the smartest, bravest, and most skilled pilot that the US Air Force had to offer. Every man that NASA drafted into their original astronaut corps of the 1960s was exceptional, but Neil stood above them all. There's an incredible backstory to all of this that's documented in Tom Wolfe's book, The Right Stuff, Highly recommend checking it out if you're interested. After what had to have been a massively stressful landing procedure, these two astronauts were able to indulge in the now famous moonwalk, one of the single greatest events in the entire recorded history of humankind. But there was still more trouble ahead for Neil and Buzz. After two and a half hours of bouncing around on the surface, the pair returned to the LEM to prepare for ascent back to orbit and rendezvous with the command module where the massively underappreciated astronaut Charlie Duke was patiently waiting for their return. The procedure here was for the astronauts to connect the life support systems of their spacesuits back to the module and then take off their backpacks and throw them out the door back on the moon. They needed to strip as much weight out of the LEM as possible. They pitched everything that they didn't need and then repressurized the module. At some point during this process, one of the two bumped into a control panel and snapped off the tip of a switch. Neil claimed that it was Buzz who must have backed into it and broke the switch. Either way, since this was an analog control panel, the only way to activate that particular circuit was by mechanically throwing that switch, which was now impossible without the tip. They couldn't reach inside with giant spacesuit fingers either. Unfortunately, the one switch that broke was connected directly to the ascent engine that they needed to get themselves back into orbit. What are the odds? Exhausted from their moonwalk, the two astronauts settled down to take a nap while NASA tried to come up with some way to work around the broken switch problem. By the time they had rested and were ready to come home, the folks on the ground still had no answer for the moon men on what to do about the broken switch. This was Buzz Aldrin's time to shine. In his own bout of split-second decision-making, Buzz grabbed a space pen from their kit and jammed it into the void left by the missing switch tip. It fit perfectly, and the plastic pen tube was just enough to secure the control that they needed to lift off. The odds of anything going terribly wrong on that mission were significant, and in the end, it all came down to human skill and ingenuity to pull it off. Of course, even the United States government knew there was a good chance that Neil and Buzz would never make it home. In this event, President Nixon had a speech prepared for him that would attempt to reassure the world that the pair hadn't died in vain, and that text was actually found later in Nixon's presidential archive. Luckily, the world never heard of it, but it's a pretty damn good speech. Here's a particularly powerful excerpt. Fate has ordained that the men who went to the moon to explore in peace will stay on the moon to rest in peace. These brave men know that there is no hope for their recovery, but they also know that there is hope for mankind in their sacrifice. These two men are laying down their lives in the search for mankind's most noble goal, the search for truth and understanding. But fate was kind to Neil and Buzz. They reconnected with the command module and set course for Earth. Smooth sailing from here, right? No. Possibly the most dangerous failure of all 
actually happened at the 11th hour, right as the capsule was re-entering Earth's atmosphere. The final procedure for re-entry was to separate the crew capsule from the service module. The plan was to have the engine on the service module fire one last time following the separation. This thrust maneuver would push the service module back up to a higher altitude so that it would burn up and disintegrate far away from the path of the crew. That didn't happen. The engine never fired, and as a result, both the service module and crew capsule came down on the same trajectory through re-entry. So the crew actually had to fly through the flaming debris of the unshielded module as it broke apart right below them. Of course, none of it actually damaged the capsule, and all three men came home safe at the end of the day. Or did they? After all of that madness, the crew of Apollo 11 had one final hurdle to overcome. See, the NASA scientists at the time were smart enough to know that there were no aliens living on the moon, but they weren't convinced that there wasn't some level of microbial life up there. They had a legitimate concern that the astronauts may have been exposed to some kind of extraterrestrial bacteria or even a virus. So the three of them had to serve 21 days in quarantine. There would be no immediate satisfaction on their return, just three weeks of sitting around waiting to find out if they'd brought back a space plague. Anyway, they made it, and hopefully you learned something new about the Apollo 11 mission today. It's a shame that the gritty details of the real-life challenges and triumphs of these human beings are kind of washed over in the official narrative. It's a great story. Let us know your favorite untold story of space exploration, and we might cover that in a future video here. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.